Hey everyone, it's Sammy and Hi. <laughs> and we are here today to dive into all of our past and future life regressions that we've had. And uh, this kind of also shares some information about our soul tribe and where we've been and where we think we're going in the future. So if you're if you've ever had a past life regression, um, this might be a little bit familiar to you, but for those who haven't, we're going to explain what a past life regression is here at the beginning. So how would you describe a past life regression? That's a great question. So there's a couple ways um, to describe it, but basically it's connecting with other parts of your soul that have had other experiences in other places, be that here on earth, be that out in the stars, be that in other dimensions. It can get really deliciously. <laughs> um, I love that word. Yeah, it's her favorite word. Uh, adventurous and complicated and life-changing. It reconnects um, the ability to kind of know the why of what things happen. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. You can do it yourself by accessing your own Akashic records, which is the kind of movement data system, like a giant supercomputer, essentially, of all of everyone's stuff, right? Of sources, adventures, really, in, in our little individual things. Um, Debbie Solaris is an amazing Akashic Records um, with her inspiration from Dolores Cannon, of course, which we'll touch on, I think, a little bit um, here and there. Um, some of our favorite people. Um, you can have um, someone else sit with you as like a past life regression therapist, which we did with um, Wendy Waddell. So we'll talk about that experience. Um, we've also had um, so many different ways. Um, we've had um, someone go into our Akashic Records, um, which is the, what Rebecca Clare does and Moni Alexander, um, and they both specialize in their own a way. Um, there's channelers who do it, um, like Dina Ziskin Fortune and uh, Lorna Marshall. They really go in there um, and they just channel it directly. So it's, it's it's so many fun different ways to do it. So really what speaks to you could just even do a guided meditation if you want, if you're like that. Some people like me, I literally dream in past lives yeah. at times. Um, I can even dream of other people's past lives if there's information in there that I need. So that's something that you can ask your guides to experience as well if you have that desire. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about what a past life is. Um, we're going to start from the beginning as we know it, as it's been told to us, and give you just kind of track down the line of how um, Allison and I have both moved through our different fractal selves and what we know to be true. So in the beginning. Which we're going to tell out of order, I think, because. <laughs> it may be a bit out of order because you don't always get all these past life, beautiful things yeah. right in the exact order. Order of human operations is not going to be order of how things happen, I guess, right? Because time is really spiral, circular, mm -hmm. all at once kind all of All time thing. is happening all at once, right? Yeah. So in the beginning for me, my story started with um, having severe anxiety for no reason. And I think I mentioned this a little bit in the other podcast too. I went on the hunt and I found this beautiful woman, um, Carol Bowman, who um, specializes in um, childhood past lives. She was kind of on the precipice and a way shower for all of that and did a brilliant work many years ago and wrote a few books. And she was still offering um, sessions, but her specialty now was just going and saying, okay, you're, tra you're, you're traumatized. You don't know why, right? And so I sat with her and we went into a light meditation, which was really great. She was so good at explaining, like, you can get out at any time. You're going to remember it. You might feel it. You could just observe it. There are so many different ways, but really allowing one to heal. Um, so she brought me back and I, <laughs> right to the trauma, right? So I woke up in that way um, and I opened my eyeballs and I was in this cave and it was really hot and I was wearing um, some interesting clothes that were not of this time and I did not look like myself and I was really anxious and scared and um, all freaking out basically 
And um, I quickly came to and realized that I was there to deter um, these three entities that were hunting our people because they were coming after something that was very sacred to us. And um, that was my child um, that I had had. And the medicine woman, who is our leader of our group, um, our little family you know, a clan, I guess, if you will, um, had taken the baby and everybody else to kind of go ahead and go through. And I stayed behind in hopes that the three of them would hunt me instead um, and give them enough time to get away. And so it really just was a lot of fire energy coming and I could feel them coming and I knew there were three. And what was really crazy is in that moment, I like my, my conscious brain was like, the rocks are talking to me. The trees are talking to me. I can hear the wind. I understand everything. I'm completely connected. So my conscious brain is kind of having a moment of like, what the hell's happening? Oh my gosh. And then my body elemental was like, oh, I remember this body and all these things and how it felt. And then you so see like all these different parts of me. Right. And then my, I guess your, my, my fractal, my higher self was like, in the emotional state of like, okay, it's just going to be real crazy. So let's get ready. <laughs> um, and so they passed me and I realized that they, uh, they uh, were interested in me. They figured it out. And so I followed them and I left the cave and I followed them through the forest. And as soon as I touched the trees, they were telling me where they were and what was going on. I could like remote view through the trees in that way. They almost had like a sonar thing between the root system and the leaves. And they kind of worked um, and it looks like, you know, like when you do sonar and it comes back and give an image like that, um, that some animals and like bats do, you know, and, uh, it was crazy. And I was just running through and I had, was running through the trees and the trees would bend down and pick me up and allow me to, um, kind of travel on top of them in that way. Um, so it very felt like, a that crouching tiger, hidden dragon movie, <laughs> you know, where I was like, that's what I felt like it was wild. And I, um, they stopped at this little grove and they had this, what I, I didn't know what it was at the time because I was kind of like living in the moment, but it was an orb, a cracked orb, um, that had, um, green and, and black and it was moving. And I was like, what is that thing? And I was completely entranced by it because even in that life, I remembered knowing what that, I knew what that was. I don't know why or where, but like, it felt like something that was really important to me. Um, and I couldn't explain it. And the three that were there, they were in like these cloaks and they kind of were human-esque in that way, but I knew they weren't like us. I knew they were from somewhere else completely, like not even on the planet. And it was very clear their energy because I was so connected in that way with everything around me and all beings um, was very absent of heart and um, very determined to complete their task. And so they dropped the orb and went on their way. And I was distracted by it because I wanted to go check it out. And then I realized that they were still hunting. It's like I forgot, right? And so I went and I followed them. And at the edge of the forest before the break in the meadow were um, all the adults. And by the time I had gotten there, um, they were all burning. And um, it was really tough. Some of them were still alive, so um, I kind of called in the trees to help um, soothe them and their souls and everything and release them as they could go because I had been trained by the medicine woman for a transition on earth uh, to release the souls, and so I was working on that, and then I went through the meadow and was getting even more um, <laughs> upset um, and stressed knowing that they were so close. If they'd already been adults, only the, like the teenagers were left now, right. Who were, you know, young, right. Like 11 or something, I guess. And, um, when I got over there, the, they, the three of them were there and two of them, they were like almost, I don't want to call them spiders, but what they did was very similar. They like put venom in, in them and they were feeding off of the children. Um, some were under bushes and hiding because there was like so much mayhem, but there was blood everywhere. And, um, I had a, a really incredible ability to um, not be seen. It was one of my special gifts that I'd always had, um, kind of almost like individual, like I, it, people just wouldn't see me, like things just wouldn't see me if I didn't want to. I could shut off my energetic 
signature. Um, and so there were, they were there. So I was able to kind of help and talk to the children and do all that and tell them I would come back for them. Um, and they stopped feeding and they went on their way and they came up to, I followed them and came up to, um, the medicine woman who wasn't very much further away. Um, and she had all the smallest children and, um, the baby, a few babies, some of the babies were carrying babies. It was crazy. And she had with the trees put up this shield in that way, like a dome shield. And they were trying to get through it. And it was like mud and roots and everything. And she was holding it on the other side. And I was able to sneak past them, of course, um, because they couldn't see me. And I came to the other side and she said, you have a choice. And your choice is to take all of the children um, and leave the baby with me and be free or to leave all of us and take the baby with you and be hunted forever. And I looked and it was really hard because here's this baby that I loved so much and I knew was really important, um, not just for me, but for the story and everything. And, um, you know, essentially my mother, right? This medicine woman who had found me and raised me from birth, um, or at least being found right as a baby. And, uh, she, uh, she left the choice to me and I chose to, um, save all the littles and some of the bigger ones. And I took, um, my sweet baby and I looked her in the eye and I felt her say, it's okay. I'll come back another time. It's just not, not the right time. It's, it's not your fault. Sometimes that's just what happens, right? Very peaceful. She wasn't crying anything. Um, and then I broke her neck <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, right then at that moment, um, the three that were hunting us literally just kind of like faded away. They just left. Um, and not in that way, but like they're, they were still physically there. Right. But they knew something had happened. Um, so it wasn't as ver ferocious, ferocious, whatever that word is. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I took the small children out and I, had um, kind of brought the other kids around and we left and um, the medicine woman stayed and um, she used the last of her life force to um, hold that signature with the baby because um, that her soul stayed to help. Um, and then once they realized that, that she was gone out of that vessel, they stopped. Um, so we wandered, of course, completely traumatized because we had lost all of our people and, um, and that was kind of the end of that session. Um, and that was it, right? I was like, oh, okay. And so after that, uh, we left. Um, so, you know, you go to the end of your life and um, it skips just, she goes, just go to the end of your life. And I was being buried in the same cave um, that I found. I really wanted to go back and it was really, I was old and I had, um, um, had been a medicine woman and um, no, no one had followed me. I was, had an apprentice, but the trees weren't talking anymore. Like we so separated from the earth. It was just time for us to be separate again. Um, and then I returned to, um, the, the light, right. I went back and that, that's when I came across a council and, um, and what was really interesting, um, sh that I found the most interesting is when you're there, you you're told, you know, you, well, she told me that it was it, very often that, um, when you get to the end and the, the thing that's been traumatizing you is that that was the decision that needed to be made. Like there was no other decision. Um, <clears throat> but when I got there, um, I realized that I had made the wrong one, at least how I felt about it. And so, um, I was at this council and I was arguing with them about it and we were having like a whole huge discussion and, um, it was my first time really understanding that I was with a council because I had had, um, seizures before and they randomly, I just thought I was having like sleep paralysis seizures and all that stuff. But really this council or maybe me, many councils were pulling me out of my body to talk to me and have discussions and reports and everything. Um, and these folks were, um, kind of stationed outside, um, still within our solar system. And really we were, we were having it out. And, um, 
I went looking for everyone and um, I couldn't find her. And that was something really interesting. I just kind of said, oh, she's not here right now, which um, I think, I mean, I don't know. I actually never asked Carol about it, but I felt like I got an energy of like, that's so weird because everyone's there, right? Like on the other side, because there's no time, but she wasn't, I, I didn't understand that. Um, and that was the first, first part of the story. And then it just goes crazy from there, right? <laughs> because after that, we went on a different adventure and that this one life, this one part has opened up to all these other lives that have been opened through all other types of reading and my own adventures and um, all of that. So that's the very, very beginning for me. My first past life came to me um, in a dream. <laughs> I It was right as I my gifts were starting to come back to me after I had shut them off as a child. And I had a dream that my dad in this life was actually my brother in the life, that, the past life. And we had come from a fairly wealthy family. Our mom was a lady in London. Um, we had a little home there, and um, but she married a not so not so wealthy guy. And my brother, I had my dad, who was my brother in that life, and then another another person I don't even know who who was my brother. And they both worked in the factory. It was like right at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And my mom was actually a big feminist. And a big part of the movement. And she had taught me how to do um, kind of like back alley abortions, essentially, at that time. And when she passed on, I took over that service for her. It was really, I remember it being really difficult and hard um, because there was a very low success rate, um, especially because we had a hard time getting a clean workspace. You know, I, not a lot was known about cleanliness and just different things, right? It was all underhanded, you know, kind of sneaky, not definitely not in a hospital setting type procedures that were being done. And I just remember how hard that life was. Um, and then I'm pretty sure this wasn't revealed to me because um, it was just a dream. And I woke up being like, well, that's really strange. Um, I'm pretty sure that in that life I had been killed for what I was doing for women. And that was my first experience. And that was before I even met Allison. And so yeah. we were just sharing one day, like, have you ever had a past life memory? Yeah, yeah, I've had a past life memory before sharing these stories with one another. And then that brings us to a good friend of Allison's um, who is struggling with cancer. And they have been coming together in a healing circle um, Oh, for what? Over a year now, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. right? To help with healing her. And we went to lunch one time and she said, hey, we just had this healing circle. And um, I just had some guy stop by and say, oh, you're all humans in this life. In the middle of doing my healings. And I was like, yeah, we're all humans. What? And he was like, oh, you're not fairies anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, yeah. And he's like, well she's coming the 13th, the unseen, she's coming and I need you to be ready for her. Are you sure you can do this as a human? And Allison's like, what are you, who are you, man? Like, where, where are you from? And so that leads into a life that we all had in Avalon. I don't know if you want to take it over from Yeah, there. sure. Um, yeah, Avalon's an interesting um, time. Um, we were um, parts of our soul family, um, came together and, um, in this particular part of the story, there were 24 of us. Um, and, um, we had, uh, chosen to go through a, like a test kind of to see where we would be, um, going to the third dimension. Cause we were from the fourth, right? and um, density rather. And uh, so we were deciding and 12 would choose light and 12 would choose dark and that would leave two, um, two unseen. So that would actually make 26. Um, but once we both, once 12 chose one and 12 chose the other, the, the other two would come to be, one would represent the whole of the light and one would represent the whole of the, the dark, if you want to call it the other side of the coin. 
to keep balance. So we all went through and those that had chosen the dark went first. Um, so they could prep and, um, and really prepare for this because we, it was all about balance in this, in this density, either or. Um, and it was really designed um, to for souls to experience lessons and um, and stories and and experience coming back to one, right? Coming back to love and and everything, right? Because everything comes from love. So the twelve of us. Um, were we all came and they brought all the sacred waters from everywhere um in in every dimension that could come and they put it in this like almost like it looked like a bird bath almost like a giant bird bath and the 12 of us um came together from the corners and we all drank from the same water um saying that this was like our contract signature um essentially saying that we would go and we would help um, because we heard the calling. And so we walked through this mist and we fell, right? Like we fell in from fourth into third, like almost like stars, like coming down to earth. And um, that is when, um, that was when I, um, and this was, I discovered, came to in a session um, with Wendy. Um, Waddell, and she um, she set the stage because I wanted to go. I was like, can I can I figure this part out? I was like, still super traumatized. I'd be like, what's happening? And I wanted to know more. So that's when um, I woke up as a human in um, in this bush, and that's where the medicine woman met me. And she said, oh, we've known you've been coming. All of you've been coming. I found you. You're with us now. And I understood everything that she was saying. And that's when she helped you raise you me. You were a screaming baby, right? I didn't scream. Oh, oh it okay. was kind of like, oh. it's like it was a shock because it wasn't like birth, mm -hmm. right? So like, I feel like in- But being, you appeared from a fairy to a yeah, baby. Yeah, like a, yeah. So I was just like, I was like, What? Like I could only my eyeballs and I just remember looking up and being like, oh my God, I missed it already. Like it was such a heartbreaking, like I was mourning being, feeling that separation because I couldn't, I could feel the others, but like, I didn't know where they were. Like I, it's the first time I'd ever been at that density. Right. And it was really hard and heavy. And there was like so much going on. Right. Because every frequency, like a symphony was there, but I could sense it all. So it was almost like being a shock. Right. I was like. Um, and I'm sure once I got in, I cried and screamed, um, did all the beautiful human things, but it was really, um, and I like looked different too, right? I was like different from them, um, but I was still human in that way. And uh, yeah, so, and then that whole life and that ties into the whole life and all the after. And so there are so many parts of this Avalon. I've always been really interested in the King Arthur storyline and being like real mad for unknown reasons as a small person of like, that's not how it is. And that's not how you get in the fairy realm. Like I was like, so I was like unhinged about it. And I remember my mom being like, why are you so mad about this? Like, it's just a story. And I was like, it happened like, a thing, you know, and so kind of coming back to that life, I was like, oh, this makes sense. And I was able to see what it was. And before I had gone as a fae um, to here or, or in, the, in an elemental, I guess, really, um, I had taken something from the king of Avalon um, that was very precious to him. And he was tied into um, our friend who was sick. And um, it was just so interesting. We found that out through um, a, a healing circle where we all went to Avalon together, right? And one one person was there and was with the unicorns, and it was so amazing. And um, you know, another like went right to the party, and the fae came down, and they saw me, and they were like, basically like took me up into the sky, and the dragons came and protected me, and the the king and the fae came and was like harassing me about this thing that I took, you know, but I'm in like present time. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. And this whole thing. But then I remembered in my past life, seeing this sapphire when I was in that realm, when we were drinking the water and I had 12 jewels, why well, 13 jewels, I had 12 jewels and then one jewel went to my heart. 
um, or was going to go in my heart, but wasn't there yet. And so I realized that's what he was looking for. And they're like, yeah, you have to return it, you know? And, um, he like, he's just so upset and I didn't mean to steal it. I meant to steal it. You guys, I did. That was like a totally, I did that. Um, I didn't know why consciously. I just knew that the dragons told me to take it. So I did. And at that time, um, I was a rogue. Like I wasn't in any storyline. I was just kind of doing what I wanted and it didn't really matter what the consequences were. Like I was living in the flow in my best life, right? Like <laughs> screw everybody else. Like this is what I'm doing, which, you know, that's how we live sometimes. And so, um, I pretended to give him back the real one and he couldn't tell the difference because I was able to, um, match the frequency to make it look the same. But I knew I had to keep the actual one, the actual Sapphire for a different reason. Um, but I didn't know it at the time, right? Because that's the thing, like these past lives come in different pieces and it's like putting it together. So that's two part three two or three parts of the Avalon story um that really um was pretty wild that's because it's all connected right then I was like oh my gosh everything is connected like truly um, it's my little experience of Avalon yeah and then I think the next time I catch up with you and your story um you had told me that you and your beautiful husband were sitting down for a dinner <laughs> And you both morphed into these past life selves. And it was like you were in this contained bubble yelling at one another about this past life. Yeah. Um, while and eating Indian food. <laughs> while eating Indian food. And this picks up right after the spider like creatures leave you um, in your medicine woman life. And you're taking the remaining children and you're wandering and you come across. Um, this dude walking on the hills, right? And we're so like dead, right? I mean, I can still hear everything and I can, I'm just traumatized and I'm the oldest one. The, but they're littles, right? They're like five or six carrying, helping me carrying these babies. We're just, I couldn't even function. And he sees me and he's like, oh my gosh, come, come to our family, come to our clan, come to our people. We'll take care of you. Um, this is wild. And I, I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. You know, and I remember him asking me about it and I was like, stuff happens. You know, like I was just like, I don't even have words. And I just knew I had to keep that part safe. And I had come with knowledge. Um, and I could tell that he was, I could feel him, right? I could feel that he was struggling, but his heart on the inside was good. It's just that he wasn't playing a good role, um, but he was trying to. And so he took us back um, to his people, to his clan. And they welcomed us with open arms and all of these women came and these men came and, um, and then the chief saw me and he instantly wanted me. Um, I guess some people would call it falling in love, but he, he really wanted me as my, as, as like a little treasure. Like he was like, oh, this is so amazing. I mean, he did, he was kind of, um, lusty in that way, right? Because they didn't have traditional marriages like now, right? They, you could have more than one experience, especially if it was based on some ceremonial thing or whatever. So it wasn't so, I guess there was more play amongst the people to help. I mean, genetically that makes sense to help keep the genetics all mixed up. Um, and so he took me in and we wedded in that way. And, um, I became the, uh, healer and doctor of the group. And that was so interesting because that part of the story I experienced and I, you know, I helped birth and all this stuff. And then I had, um, uh, a, there was a, a session that happened and that was confirmed, um, that in this clan, and I didn't know what the clan was at the time. And in this clan that they were like, oh my gosh, you're like this really respected medicine woman. You came from somewhere else. And I had not spoken to this person who was doing the reading about any of this, right? Like I just kind of, I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> I'm just going to keep this to myself. Um, yeah. And so during that time, so that particular thing, that's when um, Jared was the chieftain and I was this married person. And we were having a very heated discussion because he had stolen something from the women, from the women's tent that was very sacred medicine. And that um, because of that, the mother earth was, um, severing our connection 
to the plants and everything. We were learning, we were losing the ability to be connected um, because he had taken these things and he had said that he had gotten them and he earned them. Um, so um, I, of course, in true human form um, and as the medicine woman of the group, um, tried to poison him. And um, unfortunately, he didn't die, but he did lose something that was very precious to him. And uh, the story came to be, right, because he just, he, what he didn't, I don't know, he had really, he wanted to leave a legacy, right? And it was, a, it was a warring time, and it was hard, and everyone was dying, and sick, and it was cold, and um, you could feel the separation happening, like we weren't connected, Um and there was scarcity, right? And so when he did that, there was an eruption that happened and he and his sons kind of fought and he was a mess. Um, so essentially I said, screw you guys, <laughs> I'm leaving. And I went and lived out in the woods far enough away where it could be by myself, but where the women could always find me um, and those trusted males um, for healing. And I would come for any birth or death um, to help with the rights of that. And help the souls transition. Um, but it got to be a point where like, I mean, they were just warring all the time and it was too much. Yeah. So that happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so we were having that fight about it because we were, and I, we were there for two hours and it was crazy because we were sitting in the middle of the restaurant and it was busy. And when we were finished, um, the server came over and he was like, Oh my God, you like, he had forgotten we were even there. And he was like, he had no idea how much time passed. He saw our plates were empty and he like took a minute and you could see him being like, what happened? And so that part was really cool um, to be in, in the, in the space of that. Cause I'm still mad about it, man. <laughs> took my shit. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> and then fast forward about four to six months later and um, I'm sitting, having a beer with Allison and she says, well, we just finished our beers and we were leaving a brewery and she says, I met a dragon today. <gasps> He's really important to the storyline and I've just figured out who he is. He was with us at Vega. Right. Um, Vega. Yeah. And so that's the next little puzzle piece of our soul tribe story. Yeah. So um, this came about in another past life. Um, some of it was told to me and some of it I experienced myself, not at the same time, but um, the feelings were the same. So um, I don't know if you are aware of what they call the Orion Wars or all of that, but essentially I'm going to kind of condense it and tell it as linear as I can because there's a lot that happens. So basically those that were hunting from us on earth, um, they were a they are a um, frequency that really wants to go through the void. They want to experience the next octave, um, the next thing, right, to get closer and closer to source. Um, but part of that gig is that um, you have to have all parts, right? Like the, what do they call it? The Holy Trinity, mind, body, soul. Um, and they have turned away from their heart space. So they are trying to figure out how to get that now so they can go through. They made it, they made the decision went all the way and got to the end and they're like, no entry. No, thank you, please. <laughs> you don't have all parts of your ticket. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they've been going through the timelines to kind of, um, manipulate them so they can get what they want, which I totally get. Like they, they've progressed so far and they're like, Oh my God, I have to go back essentially. Right. Anyway, so they're really great at mind control. And um, I mean, they've mastered the, the matrix of the mind. And um, so they're able to kind of put them there, project themselves into bodies and other beings. And that had been happening. And um, they typically picked um, races that had and frequencies that had very heart centered space and very not so much mind, right? That were very almost naive. Um, in that way, right? Just like innocent and um, brought them to war. And so in that part, um, I was, the, this is before, I guess, we fell into earth. It's hard to tell in the timeline, right? Because we're not in like regular time. Um, and I like, I was at Vega because I was really worried about my sister um, who was a priestess there and this thing was happening and all this stuff. And it was getting really bad out there. And I just went, I came to make sure she was safe and, oh, and also hide the sapphire because I had that. So yeah, in that same time. 
And, um, and I was meeting with her. And at that moment, the council had met um, and there was um, the high priest and priestess and a bunch of uh, galactics and um, the dragons were there still. So it was a couple of dragons on the council. And what had happened is um, the one of the gates um, on the planet allowed for um, the stars to come into like a humanoid form in that way, like where they could lower themselves to the frequency and be able to communicate directly as opposed to being a, a flame of gas and magic, you know. Um, and so they would come through this gate in order for that to happen, in order for them to lower their density to get there, there needed to be a divine masculine and a divine feminine, um, but who each carried equal parts of each other and could switch um, almost like androgynous, but not, it's kind of hard to explain. They could, they were like shapeshifters, but they also, when needed, could adjust their, um, their divine masculine or feminine based on the need for the stabilization to open the gate. And when that happened, one of the stars came through the Pleiades and um, the from the two um, people who were there, the priest and priestess who were there, that's how I want to define them, um, realized that um, the star had been in, infected and um, by these, we're going to call them pirates or whatever, <laughs> by these uh, um, mind-centered beings. And they knew it right away. So they went and talked to the council and the council was like, we've got this under control. Don't worry about it. So there's no big thing. Um, well, they were wrong and that's okay. Um, cause that's what needed to be. They were, um, I can, they just kind of overestimated their ability to handle things and underestimated the power of the mind. Right. Because especially like in today's world, you just like throw the ego away. Can't get rid of, can't get wait to get rid of the ego and the mind and the ego are such an important part, right? It's all pieces. And so at that moment, um, there was a discussion when it, time passed and the um, the high priestess and priest got together and they said, okay, well, we need to fix this now because millions of, of um, Lyrans were dying all over the, you know, they were coming through and it was crazy. And um, these beautiful mind-centered beings were kind of taking over a few races and really going to war and um, infecting all of the star races. Um, and a lot of those that were in, who were the um, the bringers of light, who really kept the peace and were bringing the density down to fight, right? Lower and lower to 3D. Um, and so the high priestess had this beautiful, amazing, and um, life-saving idea to um, speak to the planet and to see if um, they would ascend, um, which would take the power of a phoenix and a dragon. Um, to ascend that quickly and they would have to be free will. And so they spoke to the um, Phoenix and the dragon who were one, one was on the council. And so that he talked to his, his Phoenix, his other, right. And they both agreed. So um, in that moment, um, in order to ensure the safety of the planet, uh, we um, got together and um, talked and he um, opened up and gave me his orb. And in that moment, um, when that happened, it was to replace the heart of the planet um, because we needed, they needed something powerful to be able to hold the frequency, but also be able to keep the essence of the planet safe. Um, so that, so I went and traded that out and others came too. It wasn't just me. What's a dragon's orb? Um, a dragon's orb, this is a great question. Um, it's the essence of a dragon, kind of like where they harbor all of their, it's like their center of energy. Um, and they hold, it holds all the knowledge of the universe within it. Um, that's why dragons and phoenixes and like stories are so sought after and so powerful. Sometimes why they hoard treasure, right? Because they are, they, they have this um, eternal knowledge of everything because they're a piece of a star, like in that way. Um they're so close to source, right? They, they're collected. And so some of the dragons, when um, kind of taken, like, you need to respect me kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this particular dragon was super ancient because um, they kind of just transfer their um, consciousness to newer bodies. It's really cool um, from a body into an egg, and then they're born in that way. Um, and they have whole planets like that and stuff. And so... Um, this is how they do that, their orb. So it's kind of like their, um, 
I don't know, like their own Akashic records in that way. They carry it like with them, like their own book of life with them, which is why it's re they're really sought after because it holds all the information of everything, right? Um, and to things that you kind of need to be a higher density frequency in order to hold all of that knowledge. Um, and so that also is able to stabilize a planet um, while you take the, the heart space. And so that was traded out and um, given and that we took that to a safe place. Uh, and um, the priest, priests and priestess got together and called them all. And some of the priestesses um, and others went through the portals and went to earth and brought as many people they could because when Vega ascends, all the portals going everywhere because it was like a hub, right? That's where everybody came. It was like this beautiful utopia. And it was like easy to to jump through other portals to other places. And that's why um, these mind centered beings really wanted to come because it was like a straight to earth. And that's where a key is, right? Because everything happens on earth. And um, so at the moment um, before we did everything and it started, um, they called in the flame to hold um, the, the Phoenix in and the Phoenix appeared in there. And at that moment, um, because she was such an amazing, incredible, strong priestess, um, manipulated the memories of the entire race. <laughs> and I was like, that is so dope. Also, oh my God. Um, because what happens is when the planet ascended, essentially it blows up. It, that's what it looks like in some of the dimensions, right? Or shifts out or something, but there's still... Um, remnants and frequencies um, and echoes. So when the mind-centered beings came, they could still, I mean, they're mind-centered, right? They've got all of it figured out how to find it. And so they went and um, wanted to make sure. And the only thing that survived was this orb that was cracked, that was green and black. And that brings us to the understanding of what the arachnid-like creatures were holding um, when they came to visit Allison as a medicine woman in that lifetime. Um, that's why she felt that deep attraction to it. She recognized it, and they were able to track her to that life because she was one of the last people to hold. Right, and they that took orb. those body forms Right. Because they don't have bodies. They're just be they're just energy signatures at that point because they're so high up. So they have to kind of I don't want to say like a parasite, but it's kind of like what it is. Right. They go in and control of their bodies. So the bodies that they had chosen were cloaked because they were close as they could get to humanoids. But they needed to be high enough that they could work together like a almost like a hive mind. And the arachne are so great at that. Right. They're the they're the they create the webs and they work together and they're the ones that actually um in my timeline, at least, um, help birth um, newer frequencies and create them. So it was really important. Um, they chose their, quote unquote, body vessels very well for travel on Earth. It's cool. And then we don't do many more past life understandings past that for a long time. Um, I was kind of getting sick of listening to the same old music over and over again. And I thought, I'm going to start doing audible books again. Um, and I looked at this beautiful list of books that Allison has made um, that just describes a lot of the things that she's read and collected over the years. She's a very avid reader. She has a ton of knowledge about the spiritual world and healing under her belt. And I was like, I'm going to read one of these books and I'm going to be able to have an actual conversation with her with actual knowledge, right? Which I don't get to do very often. She's, she blows me out of the water in that regard. Aww. So I'm looking through and for some reason I'm attracted to this book by Dolores Cannon, but the book that Allison has on the list actually isn't when I go to look up Dolores Cannon, I'm like, Ooh, what, what's this thing? Jesus and the Essenes. I've been having like a whole bunch of aggression about being raised in a Christian home, feeling a little bit aggressive towards the angels and the angel radio that I'm tuned into so often. And I was like, I need to figure this out. So next time when we come together, we're going to walk you through um, what we know about the Essenes, how it ties into the next trap chapter of the Soul Tribe, and then also discuss um, a future life memory 
that I've had that kind of shows where we're where a potential mm -hmm. timeline of where we're moving forward with all of this. So thanks for tuning in today. Uh, there's going to be an email in the description. If you want to email us, I would love to hear some of your guys's past life stories. And if any of this resonated with you, or if you have any pieces of the puzzle, each member of the tribe has a different little bit of the puzzle. And I just love putting all of these pieces together. It's like this beautiful web of incredible um, storytelling that we get to share with one another. So thanks for tuning in today. And we will catch you next time with part two of our past life regressions. Into future lives. Dun, dun, dun. Bye y'all. Ending broadcast.